meeting is being recorded. Thank you. Um, well, this is uh, the second uh, Rush for Linux uh, mentorship uh, series uh, session. Uh, today, we are going to talk about uh, code documentation and tests. Uh, again, uh, thank you everyone for, for coming and thank you, uh, Soa, for inviting me. Um, first of all, uh, in the previous uh, session, I will not go through, through that uh, now, but I will try to uh, be quick with a recap of a couple of con concepts that uh, you need to uh, you need to know in order to follow the, these presentations. But uh, don't worry if uh, I mean there is no need to have seen the other presentation basically. Um, so let's start with a recap. First of all. Uh, Rust in the kernel, uh, the one of the main goals of Rust in the kernel is to be able to write uh, kernel modules, uh, like drivers, in, uh, in only safe code or as much uh, safe code as possible. Uh, in order to do that, we need to write uh, safe abstractions, the ones that you see in the middle uh, there of the slide. Um, and these, uh, these uh, safe abstractions uh, wrap C APIs. Uh, the modules uh, that are meant to be written in as much safe code as possible uh, are forbidden to access directly uh, the C APIs, or at least that's the goal that we have. Currently, we have some exceptions, but uh, we want to uh, remove them uh, in the future. Um, with that, uh, a really quick uh, review of what is a safe and an unsafe uh, function. Um, there are uh, the, the unsafe keyword in Rust is uh, sometimes a bit uh, confusing uh, for newcomers. Uh, so here I have the definition from the other talk. Uh, but basically, a safe function means that there is no undefined behavior. Uh, when you call that function, there is no way you can trigger undefined behavior. Um, that also means, or a way to say it, is that there are no safety preconditions uh, around uh, to, to, to call that function. An unsafe function means the opposite, basically one that is not safe. And we prefix that with the unsafe key. Uh, that means that it has safety preconditions. We will see uh, an example of this during the talk. So uh, this is just a, a reminder. Then we also have uh, another uh, uh, similar concept, but it's not exactly the same, which is safe and unsafe for code. Uh, unsafe code means code that uh, goes into uh, an unsafe block, basically in Rust. Uh, you can think about it as uh, a place where uh, you may have uh, undefined behavior. You have to justify why you don't have uh, undefined behavior. That language is like a superset of the safe one. Uh, it means that it has access to basically everything that you can do in Rust. Uh, and on contrast, or by contrast, uh, the safe code is the code that is not in one of those unsafe blocks and does not have access to all operations. It's a subset of the language. Uh, and that's uh, basically it. Uh, I have used in this uh, couple of slides, and you will see it in the next one as, uh, as we go through the talk, you will see um, these colors. Uh, I use these colors uh, to try to emphasize or to try to clarify the difference uh, between uh, safe and safe for functions uh, and safe and safe for, for code. There is also safe, uh, sorry, uh, unsafe for, for traits, uh, etc. but uh, we are going to hear talk about functions and code. So one thing I want to make clear, because I, I, I noticed that sometimes people ask, uh, in the kernel, we are using a dialect, if you will, of uh, the Rust language, uh, which is this uh, deny uh, lint, is the unsafe operation and unsafe uh, function. And this means basically uh, what you see here. You see in the top part of the slide, what is the default, basically? Uh, consider or imagine that this G function that we have, we are calling in the, in, in, in the F function, uh, imagine that it's unsafe or it's an, an operation that is unsafe to call, right? For example, think about uh, uh, calling a C function or uh, accessing uh, a dereference in a pointer, etc. In By default, if you have in Rust a function that is unsafe, the F that you see there in red, the unsafe red, that means the, the body of the function is implicitly unsafe as well. So it's like it had an orange, an orange unsafe block, right? While in the kernel, what we are doing is we use this lint, which basically um, changes uh, the language in a way that basically that implicit block, is not, the implicit uh, orange unsafe block is not uh, anymore there. 
so just to, uh, I, I mentioned it because uh, I have seen that people watching the talk then uh, asked or, or was confused because uh, there was all these uh, unzip blocks that uh, in the default, if you will, version of, of Rust, uh, they are not needed. Uh, and just to, to let you know, it's not that we want to use this just because there is a reason. You will see why uh, during the talk, you, you will understand perhaps why uh, this is important. Uh, and this may become um, uh, in a future Rust edition. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, we, we basically agree with the idea of uh, making it the default, the what is now the dialect making it the default. So basically requiring this and block. So with that, with those uh, three things uh, out of the way, we can go to um, uh, the, the first block of the of so, the. Of the Miguel, there is one question in the um, mm -hmm. question and answer. Is unsafe yes. a standard keyword of Rust? I think maybe that's a yes. worth answering before you get into the presentation. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I was not. Yeah, this I had the I have divided the presentation in a few uh, sections. I will try to pause, but if not, please interrupt me. Uh, you can ask questions as you will. Uh, unsafe is a standard keyword of Rust, yes, uh, it's, it's a standard keyword. So in the previous slide, let me clarify that. So, so what we hear, unsafe, this keyword, unsafe, is the same. I use two colors, but this, of course, these colors are not in the code, it's just to clarify. And, and, the, and the keyword is for sure uh, standard, and you have to use it uh, in Rust. Uh, not all the time, I don't want to say all the time, because if you are writing, for example, a normal program or a driver that doesn't need unsafe code, you will not see that keyword. But uh, I mean, as, as soon as you have to reach for uh, uh, something that requires it, uh, you need to, to write. So with that, um, we are going to see a, a series of examples, from, both from the kernel and also uh, like trivial, if you will, examples to explain a couple of things during the talk, how to document a, a function. And the first one, I will start with um, uh, this C function. I write it in C. In the kernel, uh, we, we don't use I32, we use S32 or int or something else, but just to, to make it closer to, to, to C, um, I'm using I32 here. So we, are, we want to port this function into Rust. Of course, in the C side of the kernel, you should also be documented the function, right? Uh, but sometimes uh, things are either not documented or it's not, uh, you will see that there are some parts of some things in, in the Rust side that you have to really document because otherwise uh, all this uh, uh, work that we are doing to, to try to provide uh, sound of sorry safe APIs uh, wouldn't wouldn't work as well. So let's take this this function, which basically the reference is a pointer, it's a trivial function, right? And in Rust, initially you could say, okay, I, I could write this, right? There is for those of you that don't know Rust. Pub means public, so basically in the in the in the C case, uh, because we have not used the static, so this uh, this function is uh, has external uh, linkage. Uh, in Rust, more or less the same. You could say it's pub. Okay, there are some differences, but I will not get into that. Basically, what I want to, what I want to show is that this function uh, may be called by others uh, external to your module to your create, etc. So the load function has to read, uh, takes a parameter, which is p, which is a pointer. This is the way of writing a pointer in, in Rust and returns uh, the, the i32. And the referencing a row pointer in Rust is done with a star or a asterisk or depending on how you pronounce it, you, you say it, uh, like this. We don't write return, uh, return in, in Rust because the last, uh, you, could, you could write it, but we don't write it. So it's idiomatic to, not to write uh, for the last, uh, the last expression in a, in a, in a block is the, is the return of the block. Let's say. So this function returns the result of that expression. So now uh, the first thing is um, in, in, in Rust for Linux, in the, in the kernel for Rust code, we are requiring that all the public items, an item in Rust is a function, a type, modules, etc. So all the public items or all the public functions, they need to be documented. They must be documented. In fact, we have a lint uh, from the compiler that if this is not the case, you will get a warning, which we uh, we consider an error basically in the CI, etc. Et so we have to document it. So we do that here in this slide. We annotate this function with these uh, three uh, uh, slashes. If you know a bit of uh, C++, you have seen also in C, you have seen the, the way of document with with sorry with two um, uh, slashes or, or yes and 
In, in Rust, those are used, uh, two of them are used for normal comments, if you will, normal comments, like uh, any implementation comment that you will, will write, and we will see in this talk. Uh, but you use three when you want to document the following item. So that documentation applies to the to the item that follows. This is the same as we do in the kernel uh, in the in the for with uh, Sphinx uh, in the kernel or in Doxygen as well. It's very similar. Now this code as written, if you have uh, if you have worked a bit on with Rust, uh, you know that this code actually does not uh, does not compile. Uh, the reason is that. Um, the, the, the operation of the, the reference in a pointer is an unsafe one. It's an unsafe one, and that means it requires an unsafe block. And the compiler here tells you basically everything about it. So we have to write the, the unsafe block. Now, this is unsafe block, which means it's orange. I put it here in orange to be very clear. And now here is where the, 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 the important part, let's say, of, of, of documented functions, etc., uh, comes. Uh, so, when we're writing the unsafe block, as I said before in the beginning of the talk, what we are saying is, uh, or Rust, let's say, requires to write an unsafe uh, block. Because the point is that when you write an unsafe block, you want the programmer to give you the justification uh, of why uh, uh, the, the, the unsafe block is, is safe. This means, when, I'm, when I write a, a, an unsafe block, I am telling the compiler, Trust me, basically, I'm saying, trust me, this operation will not invoke undefined behavior. And because of that, we in the kernel and also other, many other projects in Rust, okay, many other projects follow the same convention. We want to write a justification for that with a comment. And in this case, it's not a documentation comment with the three slashes, but we want to write it with uh, two uh, slashes. So um, let me see if there is. Questions here now. So um, for for writing the justification or basically the proof, it's not a proof in the sense of formal proof, but uh, it's like a, like a reminder, if you will, to the next programmer that will read the code or maintain the code why this operation is actually known to not have any behavior. And remember, this has to have no undefined behavior in any case. So if you reach this part, you cannot have undefined behavior. This is like in C. If you reach a code that has undefined behavior, then uh, you are in, in deep trouble. Uh, undefined behavior, uh, I don't know if I said it before, but basically includes things like accessing uh, uh, invalid memory or yeah, an initialized memory, etc., etc. Also uh, in C, uh, sign integer overflows, etc. So now the question is, OK, Fine. We have to write this safety command. We write it with uppercase, as you see there. Uh, oh, that's yeah. fine. Uh, uh, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I have a query. Uh, is it possible to, uh, can we have safe functions inside unsafe block? Sorry, can you please repeat? Can we have safe functions inside unsafe block? Yes, yes, of course, yes. You can call, if you mean you can call them, call safe function, you mean? Calling functions inside the block, you mean? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. You can call safe and uh, unsafe functions inside a, an unsafe block. In fact, in an unsafe block, you can call, you can do anything. Basically, you, you can do everything. Every single thing that you have in the language, you can do it there. I see. It's actually the opposite that you cannot outside that block. So if I am outside the orange block, right, then I would not be able to write a star p because you will get this error, the error that we saw here. If I write this, this is a, 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 an error. In, uh, it's a hard error. There is no way to write this. It's not a, it's not a valid uh, Rust uh, program. OK, so you have to write the unsafe uh, block. Yeah, I see. There is also another question. Let me, let me read. Uh, please let me know in chat or anything if it's not uh, clear. Probably off topic, but how does one contribute to the project? Uh, yeah, perhaps we can answer that uh, later. Um, OK, so we were here saying, OK, we have to write a safety comment. And the safety comment has to justify why the reference in P is always correct. Always, what it means is any time we reach this line of code, we have to be sure that the reference in P is correct. Okay. So one way to do that, and in this case, unless we do something else, there is no other way to do it. One way is say, OK, I will ask the callers 
of my function. So if I am the person writing the load function, this function here in the slide, I just write a comment, right, in documentation, and, which I, and I say, oh, I will write the preconditions. I will add a precondition. And I will basically ask everybody calling me that they cannot call me with an invalid pointer or an unaligned pointer, et cetera, et cetera, OK? So basically, we say load has a precondition. OK, this is one way of, um, of uh, let's say, it's one way of getting the right uh, conditions or the right assurances uh, to, to, to write an unsafe code, OK? Of course, this is, looks trivial, but we will see why, why, this is, uh, why this is important and other ways of doing it. So first of all, now we have a precondition there, right? We just wrote a precondition for load. And this precondition actually is important, it's very important, so that there is no undefined behavior in the function. And remember the, the definition of unsafe function, not code in this case, but the red, the red color unsafe. The definition of unsafe function is there is no undefined behavior, right? In any case. Sorry, uh, that there is uh, the safe definition is there is no undefined behavior. But here we are adding a precondition that says P must be valid, P must be aligned. And P must point to initialize memory. If you break any of these rules, then there is an unified behavior. It's not exactly, it could be that you write a function with more preconditions than needed. That is also possible. But let's imagine that, or in this case at least, if you break the validity, the alignment, or the, or the initialized memory requirements, if you call load with any of those broken, then you will have an unified behavior. OK? So because there is a precondition that is important for safety, for not having a defined behavior, this function is unsafe. Okay, it must be marked as unsafe. So we write unsafe. We add it unsafe, as you see here, the difference. We write unsafe, the red color there. Okay. Uh, you can also see here uh, one feature that I will be also talking about during the talk. Uh, the comments are written in Markdown. And if you have written in Markdown, for example, in GitHub, or in other places, uh, the back quotes in P means that this will be rendered, and we will see later, this will be rendered with, uh, with a code block, basically, or, a, or a, you know, like a code font uh, in the HTML uh, in the render documentation. Um, when you have, because this, this precondition, coming back to the precondition, if we have a, a, a precondition that is, re is, is related to safety, what we require in the kernel, and also in other projects, they do the same. This is a common convention in Rust. What we do is put this inside a safety section in the documentation. OK, this is a convention. This safety thing that I added here, as you see here, the difference between the slides, the safety uh, section that appears will be rendered with a small title in the, in the documentation that we will see. And basically, the rule in the kernel and in other projects is if you have an unsafe function like load because it's unsafe, you have to have the preconditions written, the safety preconditions. Okay, in the safety function, in the safety sorry uh, section, we write the preconditions that are related to safety. For example, imagine you have a function that is complex and has a safety precondition, and you have also a, a, a other kind of precondition that is not related to undefined behavior. So if you break it, your program probably will have a bug, but you are not introducing undefined behavior. So you would not write it in, the, in that section. You would perhaps write it in another section or something like that. Uh, there's a question. Um, is there a specification for comments like Danny or are, like Danny or are the comments in natural language? So they, they are in natural language. The thing is, uh, I'm talking about here the conventions that we follow. For example, this safety uh, section must be, um, must be uh, uh, written if your function is unsafe. And actually, we want to have a script that checks this. Uh, we, uh, I have uh, in private a, a script that I run from time to time, but basically I want to uh, uh, put this as a, we want to put this as a, as a as something that is basically enforced for all the kernel, okay? Also for uh, safety comments in, in below in the implementation, etc. But let's not, let's not get into that. Um, so now, you see the, the path we have taken? We started here with a function, we documented uh, what the function did. Then uh, we learned that un the unsafe block is needed because the operation of the reference in the pointer is unsafe because it can have undefined behavior and it can have unbehaved behavior. Because, for example, if the caller gives you a P that points to invalid memory, it will be uh, 
basically you will crash the kernel or, or something worse or you get uh, hacked. So what we are doing is uh, in the next one, we are saying we need to write why this function is, is always, uh, it does not, it, it never triggers a defined behavior. One way of doing that, we said, is writing a precondition, adding a precondition. But if we add a precondition on P and this precondition, we are using it to make sure that the function does not trigger a defined behavior, then it means we have to put uh, um, that the function is unsafe. We have to mark the function as unsafe. We have to write that precondition. We have to put it in a safety function, in a sorry, in a safety safety section. And then finally, when we have all that done, then finally we can go to the safety command and say why this is uh, this is safe. And, and normally we say something like uh, the safety requirements of the function. This is the preconditions. Uh, means that or ensure that we can dereference de uh, the value and produce a, sorry, the, the pointer and produce a valid value, okay? Miguel, uh, yeah. uh, sorry, there is one question in the chat. Load function is yeah. already defined unsafe, then why is it required to have unsafe block? Yeah. That's the question. Okay, good question. So this is related to the, to the, um, let me go back, sorry, uh, let me go back. Related to the dialect we were talking here, uh, in normal or default Rust, if you will, by default it's true that you don't need the unsafe uh, block, the orange. Uh, but there are discussions, and there is actually this way of writing Rust, which we think is better, which is that we have to write the unsafe block. And the reason is coming back to the function is, imagine that here. You don't write the safety. Uh, you don't have to write the unsafe block. If you don't have to write the unsafe block, then you you could say, I mean, how do you know easily wh where are the unsafe operations? I mean, you can for sure write uh, Rust code uh, uh, without uh, doing that. But the point is, every time we have an unsafe block, we require that you write on top of it a safety comment, like here, the safety requirements of that to ensure that we can deliver et cetera, et cetera. So the point is, we are saying two things here, and that the different colors. So the red and safe is telling us this function. Basically, the red is for colors. The red is telling the colors, the who uses of your function, is telling this is an unsafe function. What are the preconditions? It has preconditions, because if it is unsafe, it has preconditions. And that's why we have to write this section, safety section, that says P must be valid, align, and point to an initialized memory. This is for your users, for the ones that are calling you. But then in the implementation, you have an orange block, and safe block, which is saying, this is an operation that Rust knows can potentially trigger undefined behavior. Basically, language forces you to write an unsafe block here in our dialect, in this case. And we require that you have to write the justification why this is actually safe. OK, so the orange is a proof, a proof that you basically is a, is a is the obligation that you do the proof obligation you, you are you are telling uh, everyone by writing this this is okay i know i have checked i have checked and i have ensured that this is uh, correct every time uh, we reach uh, this place okay so there are two different unsafes uh there is another question the safety comment is just a convention between software developers or is it required by rust com compiler the safety comments all the comments are conventional so you can remove all this ring color. So you can remove all the comments and it will compile. But there is a problem with that. Imagine that you don't see the comments. There are two problems. One, the user of your of your the user of your function, how can they tell whether what they are doing is safe or not? How, how they, they know the preconditions? How do they know whether they are introducing undefined behavior or not? The only way they could do that is basically opening your function. And reading the code and checking whether what they are doing is correct. Basically, checking that for all the input parameters that they are using, for all the basically, if you are calling with uh, p null, for example, a question you could have is, can I call this function with p null, for example? Like, for example, uh, I know uh, you may have a deallocation function, for example, that allows you to pass a null pointer or not. It depends. It depends on the person that specify the function, whether it allows a particular value or not. So if you don't have the documentation or that specification or something, then the only way you could know is uh, going ahead and, and reading the code. And sometimes we actually have to do this in, in the kernel. 
So what we are doing here is ensuring that all the preconditions are written. So basically, if you have an unsafe function, you have to specify clearly. I mean, it's, that, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a formal specification. It's not, there is not a formal uh, uh, way of, uh, they, are, they are not formal uh, preconditions, but you have to be clear what are the preconditions so that people, users calling you, know what they have to uh, upheld. OK, so let's go ahead. Uh, we can review back this. Uh, perhaps it, it gets clearer later. So to, to recap a bit on, on this, there are two things, safety sections and, and uh, safety comments. There are two things. And sometimes when one is starting with Rust, you may confuse them, right? like when I need one or the other. So the safety sections are for colleagues, as we said, and they describe the preconditions of the function like any other preconditions. It's just that those preconditions are related to whether the function may, may trigger a different behavior or not. So the, the, if you, basically, if you don't have the preconditions, the function is not guaranteeing anything. There is no guarantee there is not different behavior. This is exactly the same as we see here in the function we are started with from C, which is a completely normal function in C. The only way you can know whether uh, P, what, what, what values of p you can pass is checking what you are doing in the function. If you write documentation in this C function, then you would, you could also write the, the comments here. Okay, but there is a difference with Rust, which is Rust has a language uh, way of requesting that or, or marking a function to be uh, to have safety preconditions. Okay, and then the callers of this function, if the function is unsafe, it requires a block, an unsafe block, to call it. So you cannot call a load fun the load function here. You cannot call it from a, a from safe uh, Rust. You have to write an unsafe block, the orange one. Okay. Uh, yeah. So coming back to this slide, uh, you can review it. You can also uh, download them and, and, and try to uh, read them. The I have not dated here, but it's not, it's not really important. They are also used. Uh, not important for this talk. I mean, they are also used. Yeah, the, the, the unsafe keyword is also used for traits. Uh, we use it in the kernel as well, etc. But to be simple here, let's talk about only uh, the functions and the, and the, and the uh, sorry, uh, the functions. Only. There is also a safety comment, as I explained, a safety comment in the kernel. Again, in the kernel, we require that they have to have a, 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 the, all the unsafe blocks have to have a safety comment okay, above them. Um, okay, so let's let's try to see now uh, an example from the uh, from the from the kernel. This is in this slide. I have an example copy pasted exactly as it is from the kernel. Um, so please consider this function. Okay, there is a function called name, and we see here uh, something is doing. Basically, is uh, I can walk through you through the, the function. Let pointer basically declares a variable pointer a binding uh, and we open the uh, Nancy block, the orange one, uh, and calls uh, bindings. Bindings here in the kernel uh, is the, the C side of the kernel, let's say. So the bindings are the, the, the functions of the kernel. So there is in the kernel, in the new kernel, there's a function called rname, which returns a, a, a string representing the error, as the function says. And we pass uh, this self dot zero. This is not important here, but the point is, how they are justifying this call. So in this case, as you see, it says just a FFI, so foreign uh, function interface call. There are no extra safety requirements. As you see here, we are actually saying there are no extra safety requirements. We also sometimes, when, when we do calls to C functions, because the, the calls to C functions uh, may have requirements, uh, we want to say, OK, this unsafe block is only there because we are calling a C function. Basically, in Rust, you are required to, to write an unsafe block when you call a, a, a C function in the kernel. OK? Uh, so if you don't see that there, there are no extra safety requirements, you could wonder, as a reader, you could wonder, OK, yes, this is a, a C call, but there are something else. Is there something else that you are not writing here? Is there something missing? So by writing this, basically, we are making sure we are telling the reader uh, this function does not have any, any precondition. So one way, as you see, of just justifying that there is no, uh, there are no, um, sorry, that there are no uh, other uh, conditions that you have to upheld. One way is just to examine the C function 
for the function you are calling, checking all the preconditions and see if there, there are preconditions. For example, in this case, uh, in the kernel, I think there, were, there was no uh, documentation, I think, uh, but I may, I may remember correctly, or it may be there now, uh, about what are the, 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 the possible input values. Okay, so error name may tell you, okay, I admit uh, error values from zero to something, or perhaps it does everything. What I, when I, when I checked, um, I saw that the, the code, checking the code, reading the code, um, basically it works, there is no undefined behavior, it doesn't, it's not it works, but there is no undefined behavior for any input value. So if you pass a, an invalid uh, uh, error code, it will return uh, null, if I remember correctly, okay? Yes, because we are checking it here. So what we do is then we check if it is null or not. And then there is here another answer block. And this is the one that is more important here in this slide. So in this one, we are saying the string returned by error name above, so the pointer that we have now, is static and is null terminated. So this is yet another way of sometimes justifying an assay block. We are basically using the post condition of the error name above. So we know, however we do it, did it, for example, reading the documentation or examining the, the source code, it depends. What we are doing is, we are taking the error name and we know that either returns null or a valid uh, string that lives basically forever in means. Okay, it lives for the entire uh, uh, lifetime of the kernel. Okay, so first of all, if we didn't put the, uh, for example, imagine we didn't put the if here, the, the if uh, uh, if pointer is null. If we didn't put if pointer is null, then we have two cases. One is uh, the pointer is null, and we will be calling this function from char PTR with a null, and that's, that's not uh, valid, okay? This function has a pre precondition, which needs to be written in the documentation, etc., etc. So you see, this goes it's like a chain of, of things. From char pointer requires that there is the, the, the string that you pass has to be uh, valid uh, forever, basically, okay? And uh, it's not like exactly... Um, because then we will need to talk about the lifetimes and the reference that we are returning here. But just imagine that we have to return, a, 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 we have to input a pointer that is valid for the entire you know, lifetime of the kernel. So we know that the string, the pointer that error name returns is not null or not. If it is null, we return and we don't go to that unsafe block. Okay? So there is no unsafety here. There is no undefined behavior, sorry, here. because. Basically, we, we don't reach that line. So we have checked that the null case, we are not in the null case. And if it is not the null case, then we know that the, the error name promises us that the string lives forever and uh, is null terminated. So we can call that function. And that way, we have basically proven, in between quotes, we have proven that uh, this is always safe when we reach uh, this line of code. OK? So to recap a bit uh, and to try to uh, give you a bit of more context and not uh, confuse you, there are two three ways we have seen to justify so far a safety comment. One is basically asking the callers to do for some precondition, basically telling the callers, okay, you guarantee it, and then I use it. It's like forwarding, if you will. Uh, you ask somebody else, okay, if you call me, then you have to uphold this precondition, and then I will use that precondition to call something else or to do something else, like be referencing a pointer or anything else. A second way to do it, like we see here in this slide, is you check the implementation, you check all the preconditions, you see that basically you comply with all of them, perhaps because there is none, and then you just write it, okay? Another way is, yet another way is, sometimes you write, uh, you, you use uh, conditions or you know something is true because something else in your function, in the same function, uh, uh, tells you. For example, here, her name, again, has a post condition, whether it comes from the documentation or because you check the code, et cetera, et cetera. You know that the, the string lives forever and it's not terminated, uh, or that, or it's not, but we check that. So basically, we are using something else previous from our function, and we, we just uh, uh, reuse it or we use it down in the function. And we do this a lot of times. Another case of this simply is, for, for example, imagine that you, you have to pass a function, uh, an integer that has to be 0, 1, or 2. If you declare a, a variable and you initialize a variable with zero, one, or two, then you can write a safety comment saying, uh, I just initialized 
uh, my variable to zero, one, or two. Okay, so basically what I'm trying to say is this way of justifying is local is something that you see in your function or, or, or you, you, you know because of other operations or other calls or other code in, in your function. Okay, uh, let me see the questions. Is it correct for safe precondition to specify some rules to achieve correct behavior of the function? Say function never crash, but may return incorrect result and not not the rule to achieve safe operation on the function, uh, no crash, no null pointer exception. Uh, let me try to understand. Uh, it depends what you mean by correct behavior, because if the, basically the preconditions that you, 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 the safety preconditions, they have to be related. I mean, they don't have to, but there is no point otherwise to have the precondition. The safety preconditions should be related to whether to, to basically you need to write as few, because you could always uh, write more preconditions, but what you want for your callers to make easy or, or more flexible the function is to reduce the preconditions as much as possible, right? So you want to reduce the preconditions. So you normally, you, what you, you want to find is the smallest set of preconditions that make the function never trigger undefined behavior. So if you have other preconditions that are not related to undefined behavior, normally you don't, you don't want to specify them there. You may have other preconditions in the function here, we have other things that are not related to safety. For example, imagine that the load, uh, uh, imagine that there's a bug or there's a precondition not related to memory, not related to data races, et cetera, et cetera. It's just that, for example, you call load with, uh, I don't know, in some context in the kernel, or you call load in, in some other thing, then it's a bug, or you know it's a bug. But then you would say it, you would say, uh, uh, the precondition is that this, is, uh, this value is whatever. For example, if you need that they call you with uh, some value that is zero, one, or two, then you would write it zero, one, or two. As long as the zero, one, or two that is not involved, basically, on whether there is undefined behavior or not, if you don't use it uh, uh, in your function for, for justifying anything, uh, then, then, then it should not be a safety precondition. I hope that that makes sense. It's normally when you write code and you see examples, and examples is, is basically comes uh, more natural. Why we use CSTR? Let me see. Let me go there. CSTR. Uh, here. Why we use CSTR and save? Can we use static STR and string as they are safe already? Well, this is an example I, I tried to basically I, I search for. Uh, there are other ways of of, uh, of the, doing the things, but first, we don't use in the kernel in general. We don't use, we don't want to use STR, the Rust type STR. For others that may not know, STR and Rust is a UTF 8. Uh, Encoded basically is, uh, it supports Unicode. Uh, normally, we don't use Unicode in the kernel, so there is no need uh, for, for Unicode uh, in the kernel. Uh, so, we have other types like CSTR, BSTR, etc., um, uh, that we use. Uh, so, but, but regardless of that, the point is I basically searched for the, for in, in the kernel, I searched the kernel for, for uh, an example that's had two cases of safety, different ones, and, and one used something else, and I picked this, this example. Uh, we would need more context actually to, to know what uh, what this is because this is actually a method so we need the, the, the where this is etc i mean that there is uh, the, the point of the example is not really uh, to discuss whether it's str or string but yes in general the answer to that is that in the kernel we don't use unicode or i mean we don't need to use unicode unicode sorry is there any restriction on the kernel to uphold the preconditions uh it depends on what you mean any restriction um so the preconditions the callers of your function, for example, here, the callers of your function, they are the ones that have to uh, 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 basically uh, to be correct and not to trigger any behavior. Your callers, the people calling or the users calling load, they have to uphold this precondition. If they don't, basically, they are introducing a, a very serious bug in the kernel. It's exactly like in C, if you hear you call this function, imagine you have this C function somewhere and you call this function with an invalid pointer. Then, uh, yeah, this is basically a serious bug. If the question is more related to whether this is somehow automated, perhaps, uh, I don't know. Um, basically, uh, uh, it's, it's basically a compiler forces you, if you have a, an unsafe function, for example, if you have an unsafe function here, uh, load, the compiler will not allow you to call load just like that from safe code. For example, a driver. Imagine you are in a driver, writing a driver. 
if you by mistake call load because you for example read the documentation quickly or you didn't check the documentation and you say oh i know there's a function called load let me call it here in the, in the driver then sorry the compiler will not compile that code because you need to write the unsafe block and that's the point that you write the unsafe block and when you write that same block then you have to provide the, the justification and that's why we require the justification okay so that's the the the, the does the compiler add extra code for an unsafe function? Uh, no, an unsafe here is completely static. There is no, uh, there is nothing. Uh, I mean, we will see uh, a bit later uh, other ways because isn't, unsafe doesn't do anything uh, for code generation. It has nothing to do with that. But sometimes you want to not have unsafe functions. You want to have safe ones. And to do that, sometimes uh, there are other ways to, to do that. That's what we are going to see uh, next. Um, is, there is one question in the chat box, uh, Miguel. Yeah. I think you already answered that, but I just want to make sure. Name function yeah. has unsafe block. Isn't it required to be defined as unsafe? Uh, let me see. Uh, name function has unsafe block. Let me go back. Sorry. Let me go back to the. Uh, load functions already defined and take why it's required to have and say block. If you mean the orange one inside, uh, is required because of the dialect. That yes, I, I, I we already uh, saw that. Uh, there is another question, uh, and then I will I will continue because otherwise we don't cover the. Um, if there is an unsafe block with safety comment, okay, is it possible to modify this existing unsafe block which does not match the safety comment anymore? Yes, of course. I mean the comments. They are not formal proofs. This is not um, like, uh, you know, you are not doing a Spark, for example, ADA, ADA Spark. You, you, you don't have uh, automated uh, proofs. So these comments, they have to be maintained. But as we, I would like to say, if we have time in the end, uh, the point of these comments is, is to, uh, to ease the maintenance and to be able to, for, for a reviewer, when they review the code or they change the code, they, they, in, they, they have to have this information in order to know whether a modification of the code remain basically keeps the system sound, keeps the system uh, working. For example, if you modify the implementation of load, then you may be adding, maybe removing as well, but you may be adding new preconditions for the caller. Okay, you may be touching the function in a way that you are adding uh, preconditions. So you first, you, you, you want to have to change the safety justification perhaps. You may have to add preconditions in the, in the, in the function. And you may have to, if you do that, then you have to go to the callers, just like you would do inside in C. You will have to review all the colors if you change uh, the preconditions of function, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, okay, so let's let's go to yet another uh, or yet another uh, another way, but this is a very very powerful one. Um, a way to because okay, let, let, let me try to come back a bit. We have these ways of justifying that we saw three ways of justifying um, uh, uh, this unsafe blocks, but as you could tell, or you could say, well, but this is uh, basically uh, we could do this in C, and there is uh, there is a uh, is a major effort, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We want for these unsafe functions, but we want really in the kernel at least, and I I, I mean mostly in, in most uh, Rust projects, or, or you want to use Rust to begin with because you want to write as much of your code as possible, if possible all your code in safe code, okay. And to re remember the beginning of the presentation, we, in order to do that, we have to write abstractions. We call them abstractions, like safe abstractions of unsafe code, right? So actually, what we want is not to have to write, for example, unsafe here, the, the red one. We don't want to write the red one. What we want is to have a load function that is safe. And then users don't have to care about safety preconditions because there will be none safety conditions, okay? You may have complexity inside the, the, the abstractions and you have to think whether they are sound, whether, whether there is no way to trigger and define behavior uh, uh, with the preconditions that you put or no preconditions. But basically the, the idea is to try to enable users of different subsystems in the kernel to be able to use as many functions as many APIs completely safely. That means from the safe subset of Rust. Because if you do that, then the writer of the driver, for example, or the kernel module, they don't have to care about that. Basically, the abstraction is the one with the burden of ensuring that that's uh, correct. Okay. So one way of doing that, and for example, take this uh, load example. 
one question you would have, okay, so how do I do that? How do I, I don't want to basically pass to my colors for a pointer uh, that, that the pointer has to be valid, aligned, and point to initialize memory because then this is uh, the same as, uh, as C. Basically. So we are going to see one way. We are going to uh, attack this uh, with, with an example again. Um, then we will see also a, a kernel example. And then I will tell you why, why this way basically is, is very powerful. So first of all, let's start with another example. Let's start with, uh, uh, with this example in the slide. Let's assume there is a printer or C function. Okay, this doesn't exist in the kernel, but I, I put it for, for clarity and to try to come up with a, with a very easy example. So imagine that there is a, in the kernel a printer or function. And this printer or function has some precondition, okay? That the code that we want to print is uh, within some range, for example, from zero to max error or whatever. So if we don't pass a code that is correct, for example, the code, the implementation of printer, or you could think there is an array, for example, of pointers to strings, and then the, the, it will call print K uh, with uh, indexing that array. And if you pass a code that is not within the array, then everything blows up, right? So imagine that a printer function with a usual precondition, let's say, and that is a safety precondition. Even if we don't call them safety preconditions, it would be a safety precondition in, in C. And actually, if Rust gets into the kernel, uh, it would be nice or interesting to start documenting the C side as well uh, with this information because it's very powerful to, to uh, understand code and then to make the safer structures at least in the, in the Rust side. Okay, so we start with the function. We create, a, again, a safe uh, printer function uh, that takes a code. Uh, and the code, we, we don't know anything about it, and we have to justify again why it is safe. And as we know, as I said, print error. Right now, as I told you, there is a precondition, and it's a safety precondition. So there is no way, at least uh, in this way, there is no way to, to uh, justify. But we don't want, we could do, one, one thing we could do, of course, is go like in the previous example, and we could just put unsafe in the print error, in the Rust function, we could put unsafe, and then add the precondition to the colors. Okay, give me a code, an error code that is basically valid for print error or something like that. We could do that, but we want to avoid that, okay? Because we want that, for example, a driver calls print error directly with nothing else, okay? With no unsafe uh, block. So first, what we are going to do is we create a type. Uh, we have to go, sorry, we have to go a bit quick because otherwise uh, the time runs out. Uh, but I will, try, I will try to focus with this. Uh, the later part of the presentation is not uh, as important, I think. So I will, I will uh, nevertheless wait a bit, uh, spend some time here. There is uh, this type. We create a type. This is a struct with a single field, okay, that wraps or contains uh, the, the integer, okay, the error code that we want. And we document it because it's a public type. So we have to document it in the kernel with the conventions that we have. So we start with that. Then we add, so we are going to add a uh, couple of methods, okay. In Rust, you write that to, to start writing your methods, basically. First, we will add a constructor. Uh, let me go you through this. You see here, this we just added, as you see, we just added the, the, nothing else changed. We just added uh, uh, the function, the method there, uh, which actually is, uh, you could say, it's not, it's not a method because it doesn't take cells, but nevertheless, uh, it's a constructor. It takes a code, an integer. And it returns a result. A result in Rust is whether it's, it's basically the vocabulary type that you use to, to denote whether the, the, the function uh, had an error or not. It's a type that contains two variants, basically, whether it's OK or it's an error. Um, so it returns uh, whether the, the function uh, had an error or not. If it didn't have an error, then it gives you the error code type. OK, so it gives you a struct or an object of the type struct error code, and it gives you just the struct with the error code inside. It doesn't do anything else. And if the code is bigger than some constant, uh, then it returns an error, OK? Uh, I will pause a bit here in case there is some question about this, because it's important that we get here so that we, OK? So what we are doing so far is just one function that returns uh, a new type that is called error code. Well, we are not doing, you may think, oh, we are not doing really uh, much. Now, the key thing here is that, at least so far, with the code that we have in the, in the slide, 
if an error code exists anywhere in the program, then the code has to be valid by construction. And this is key. It's statically true. I mean, there, there is no way you can compile a program where if you have an error code, it's invalid. Okay, this is the, the, the this is the key. Okay, so let me let me let me explain uh, why the, that is true. One thing why that is true is because the in Rust the people outside the code users or the programmers outside your, for example, the kernel crate, let's say, they cannot modify your your integer. So they cannot just go into your struct and modify the integer. Okay, they have to go through the methods to to access uh, the integer. So right now there is only one method. And that method, the only thing it does is return a new error code. And because we check that the, the error is within the bounds that we care, then there is no way, because there is no other method, there is no other function, there is no other uh, way to, to, to get a, an error code that uh, has a, an invalid error. Okay, of course, this means, this of course uh, assumes, but I, I, let's, let's, I mean, that, that, that's, there is no way to get around that, that there is no memory corruption, that there is no undefined behavior, there is no, you know, a C function going through your memory and replacing values, that there is no hardware errors, uh, soft events, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But about, about, apart from that, if the, if the rest of the code doesn't have any behavior, then there is no way you can get an error code that is invalid. Okay? Now we add another method, very easy, um, called to code, which basically takes your, your struct, a reference to your struct, and returns a uh, the, the, a copy of the of the error code, okay, an integer returns an integer with the container error code, okay. Uh, the syntax doesn't matter. The self dot zero returns the first uh, value, etc. It doesn't really matter the syntax. Um, and now uh, the difference here with this slide is precisely because we know this, the, the thing that we have here is if an error code exists, then the code has to be valid by construction. Precisely because of this then this method, we can write a post condition on this method. We can say, OK, all the i32s that I am returned, they are guaranteed to be valid, right? We know that the error code is always valid. Therefore, if I call to code, because I have to have an object, so I can only call to code to, a, to, an, object, to, to, to an object of type error code, then it will return me the integer. And because I knew the integer has to be valid, then that integer that I, am, I get, I get it, it is valid. Statically, we notice, okay, by construction. There is no way to construct a program without any fine behavior, et cetera, et cetera. There's no way to construct a program that returns here uh, uh, something with, the invalid, uh, with an invalid error code, okay? So now we can go back to our function where, where, that we wanted to justify the safety comment, right? And we are going to do a few changes. The first one, instead of which is the key, the first thing is we remove the parameter code which took the i32, and we are going, well, well, what we are going to do is take the, the error code. Okay, we are going to take an error code, and again, if I know I have an error code, then I know it will be valid, right? So I just call to code, and I can I can just call it the print error function because I know it's going to be valid. And so the justification that I have to write in the safety comment is the error code returned by to code is always valid. For example, this uh, is one way of writing it, right? And now the key is that we didn't have to write unsafe in print uh, and the red unsafe, the unsafe function. Print error is a safe function. It's not an unsafe function anymore. Of course, how we are doing this is not, not magic. Basically, what we are doing is instead of having a precondition saying, oh, the code, you have to call me with a code that is valid, what we are doing instead is saying, you can only call me, otherwise the compiler will basically reject the program. The only way you can call me is if you have an error code. Okay? So if you give me an error code, then uh, I just call the other function and everything is, is fine. And this way, a driver, for example, can use this function. Imagine that error codes, you create error codes from some subsystem in the, in the kernel. Instead of giving you the subsystem, instead of giving you an I32, it will give the driver an error code. And because it's an error code, the driver knows, basically not the driver, but this function, the driver can just call print error with that error code, just passing the error. There's nothing to do, basically, you just pass the, the, the error code. And then with the error code, 
because the printer is, is a safe function, there is no need to write any unsafe in the drive. Okay, there is no, no need to put uh, unsafe code in the drive. And as long as this code, the one that we have here, and as long as the implementation of error code, not the drivers, the implementation of error code, as long as the implementation of error code is what we say in Rust sound, as well as, as, as long as it's sound, or as long as uh, you can say, as long as it's correct, and there is no way to basically um, uh, reach a state of error code somehow that then the, the condition of two code is, is not correct anymore, then as long as uh, this code is, is, is correct in that sense, then all the drivers can call this function just uh, uh, with no worries and no, no, that they are not going to do this kind of behavior. They are not going to go beyond the bounds in the print error function when they go to the C side. Basically, this is the print error function in Rust, goes to the C side, that one will go beyond bounds. Okay? And this is basically the key of how many other things are done in, in, uh, in Rust. Um, and you will use it all the time. Okay? Uh, let me see if there is questions. Um, so when, yeah. when you instantiate error code, shouldn't you be calling from code uh, to ensure that the validation is done? Sorry, can you repeat? When so, you call? Uh, so when you instantiate error code, uh, yeah. shouldn't you be calling from code to ensure that the validation is done? The That's validation. the thing. Exactly, exactly. The, the thing is that basically I, I'm not showing here the, the call to from code, but it doesn't matter because when you arrive to this function, you have to have somehow an error code, right? Somebody else will call from code and we call the constructor and give you the, the, the thing. Okay. But so what I'm trying to show here is, yeah. Go ahead, so that, please. The assumption is like uh, from code is called, right? Before calling print error. The, the, no, the assumption, that's not an assumption basically. What, what I'm saying is that that's the only, it, it cannot happen otherwise. Mm -hmm. It's impossible that it cannot be done like that. Basically, there is no way you arrive at a program you cannot write a program that if you have an error code, you have not done the check. Because to get an error code, you have to go through from code. Because there is only one constructor. I mean, in the, in the real code, there are more constructors, etc. You have to take care about things. But the, but the point is that if you do your type correctly, regardless of whether there is one constructor, two, three, it doesn't matter. The point is, in this example, you have one constructor, right? Which is the simplest case. You have one constructor. If that constructor performs the check here, the if, then the only way to get an error code is to have done the check. Basically, the, the fact that you have an error code somewhere in the program is the proof. It's proof. It's not, it's not just an assumption. It's actually proof that you did the check at some point. It could be in another part of the kernel the check. It doesn't matter because somebody in a, some subsystem completely different from the driver that you're writing, for example, they could have called the front code. And then the driver received the error code. And it doesn't matter how you arrive to the error code. But the point is that no matter how you arrive to an error code, if you have an error code, then it has to be valid. Got so it. the existence of the error code is the proof, basically. OK, got it. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, uh, let me see. Um, yeah, so going back to this, there are just to continue this question. And thank you for, for this question. There are other sometimes in real code, and, and we can see. Uh, we can see. I don't think we will have time, but we can see that, for example, there may be another constructor that you may have in your type that is unsafe. For example, you may provide to your user two constructors. One that is safe. This one that you see here in the slide. And that one always checks, basically. There is no way to fool this constructor, right? So this, this constructor is safe. Then you may have another constructor, for example, that is unsafe. And that means you have to say to the caller, you have to provide me with a valid error code. Why do you do that, you say? Why, why if I have the safe one, why would I want an unsafe constructor? Well, the point of an unsafe constructor is sometimes you may no, because of other reasons that your code is already valid and you have a performance requirement or some, you, you want to remove the branch basically. You, you, you don't want to pay for the branch. 
this branch here, the if. Imagine that you have a code from somewhere in the kernel. You know that code is always, always, always uh, valid. But then you want to give a Rust driver. You don't want to give the i32. You want to give it the error code, the, the one that is uh, good and can be used safely. So what you do there in your subsystem is, OK, I know this error code is valid, for example, because it's a constant, let's say, the simplest case. You have a constant, and, and you have a constant, and the constant is one of the valid error codes in the kernel. And you say, OK, this is the constant. OK, so I construct, I call from, uh, from code and save, which normally is called from code unchecked in Rust. They put the postfix uh, unchecked, which is an unsafe function. And that unsafe function doesn't do the if, but is unsafe. So basically, the user of this type chooses how to construct. Either you pay the price of the branch because you don't know whether the error code is uh, is valid, and then you pay, pay, pay the price. But in turn, you don't need any any unsafe blocks to call it. Or you call the unsafe constructor, but then you, are the caller of that constructor, has to verify and has to provide the justification why. Basically, they have to provide the proof. Okay, this basically is providing you with the proof. This implementation, this safe function, is is basically checking because it's checking. There is no other way uh, uh, to to get it wrong. I mean, of course, if the implementation of the function is Incorrect. If you make a bug in, the, in this function, then the whole system goes down. But the point is to write everything in a way that is is is, is correct. And there, then drivers will, there are the drivers or the users of this function. They cannot make a, a mistake regarding unified behavior. Okay. This actually applies to not just unified behavior. Huh? You can use this kind of uh, constructions for other things that have nothing to do with unified behavior. But here we are concentrating on safety comments and safety uh, uh, annotations. So going back to the type invariants, uh, sorry, another question. Are there situations when constraints are not known before? For, uh, an explanation before actual call to unsafe code. If yes, how to deal with them? Uh, are there situations when constraints are not beforehand? Um, depends on which which uh, constraints are you uh, you mean. If you mean if you mean the the, the you don't know, for example, when calling print error, you don't know whether you have a code that is valid or not. Well, then, then basically you would, you cannot write the justification, and then you would say, uh, I mean, the, the, you you have to find it basically. Otherwise, uh, you are just hoping for the best, right? It's not different in C. In C, when you are writing a driver or anything else, you really have to be sure that you are not uh, blowing up the kernel somewhere else. You, you cannot just take. Uh, something and just uh, right so you have to always that's why we always require the justification and the point of requiring this safety comment is twofold one is again to ease the maintenance of all these uh, preconditions uh, proofs in between quotes not formal proofs but uh, that's one thing the maintenance side but the other side is um, also to, to for, for the people writing the code for the first time to force them to actually think and write why this is the case, OK? And not just say, oh, I did an inspection of the code. I think this is the thing, and that's it, OK? Basically, you are forced to write it. And when you are forced to write it, you actually see that it, it, it takes some effort, especially in the beginning. It takes some effort to, 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 to write these comments, because you, you are basically are asked to, to tell. It's like if in a review, everyone in a C code where you are doing a dereference or any other unsafe operation, everyone is asking you why this is Basically, why you are, you are not introducing a vulnerability here? Why you are not? Uh, why this uh, the reference will be always okay? Why there is no overflow here? Why etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Okay. Okay. So and now with uh, going back to invariant. Uh, so here we have seen what we call a type invariant. Okay. We have seen we have seen it, but we have not actually uh, talked about the invariant yet. The invariant here basically is that we have a type, error code, which is called error code. And this error code maintains an invariant. An invariant is that it's like a property, if you will, of a type that is always true. Basically, it's, it's something that always applies. Okay, It's like a proposition in logic or something that you, you know that as long as that type is anywhere in the program, then it has to be uh, uh, the, 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 the proposition or the property has to be true. Okay. So what we do is we have an invariant section that we write on top of types 
that have this kind of invariants. And there are many of, I mean, in many cases, we, we do this. And we write, what is this? For example, here, an example is we could say, the error code is within the interval of valid error codes as defined by specification X. Uh, here I am talking about perhaps not the kernel, but uh, something like uh, POSIX or whatever. Okay, somebody defines what is a valid error code, and then you say this type will always, always, always have an integer inside that is within that range. Okay, if you will, in this case, in this example, you could think of error code as a as a as a type that uh, is like a constrained integer, and that's the, that's the key because this is a constrained integer. That's why you can remove the preconditions in a in a in a in a function like this. Instead of taking an i32, which is basically unconstrained, it can take any of the of the integer values uh, in, in the, that, that fit. Instead of doing that, I say no. I uh, I don't allow any integer value. I only allow an error code. And an error code has this invariant, which is that it has to be that within those that, that interval. And that's how you are removing the precondition that you, you would otherwise have to write in preterm. You would have to make it an unsafe function like we did in the previous uh, example. Here, quickly going down, we're going back. Here in load, we took load and had to make it unsafe, the red unsafe. We had to make it an unsafe function. The reason is because basically we we said, okay, fine, the caller has to do the, the check or has to know that the pointer is valid somehow, for example, because you are pointing to your own stack value, for example, okay? But, 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 but sometimes we don't want to do that. And in fact, Rust, if you have uh, studied a bit of Rust, you have seen references and mutable references, etc. References are actually a type that has an invariant, which is the reference points to a valid, initialize, et cetera, et cetera. Memory. So in, in, in RAS, for example, you normally you don't take a pointer as an input parameter. You would take a reference to the E32 or whatever it is, the, sorry, the I32, whatever it is. So the reference in RAS is a way to constrain the, the, the possible basically pointers, if you will, that you can receive. So you constrain them. You say it's not a pointer, it's not a raw pointer, it's not an unconstrained pointer, it's an unconstrained pointer. Sorry. So instead of taking a, a, any pointer, I will take only a reference. And because of how Rust defines references, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, then the load, this function, would know that the pointer is valid and align and points to initialize memory. And then you don't need unsafe in the in the implementation of the function, for example. Or you don't need, uh, you, and also the, the function most likely, uh, it depends. There are cases, et cetera, we, we have it in the back of the slides. This question about this, but the load function wouldn't need probably in this case at least to reference it. If it is this function, and the only thing we want to do is the references, if it is a reference in Rust, it's not a pointer, then it's not unsafe because we know the reference always points. And actually, Rust does not consider the reference in a, a reference unsafe because there is no way you can get that wrong. Basically, if you the reference a reference, you the reference a reference, then it's always valid. Okay. So, so, so if you if you uh, if you are writing this function and it's not for some other reason, sometimes you have to take raw pointers in the kernel, etc. We in the abstractions we have to use them. But I wrote this example to show you what is the problem, what is one way of um, uh, providing the guarantees on the pointer that you need. But there are other ways, which is using type invariant, for example, which allow you to have a type that is constrained. For example, here with an integer, but it could be a pointer with references, or it could be anything else. So you create a type, give it some invariants, and then everyone that receives that type knows statically that the type, uh, that the, what the type, uh, the properties that the type uh, provides. Okay, I hope that that is uh, that is clear. So I, I said coming back, and I will uh, go quicker. The this is a, this is a key idea here in the, in the talk. Um, and one, one that we spent a bit of time in the previous, uh, but it was hard without the slides to, to explain. Uh, so here, the error uh, code is, uh, we wrote this invariant. And now what we do also in the kernel, this is again, another convention. What we do is that every time, because consider that error code, imagine that you're modifying error code, the type itself. Then you, you have to always, when you modify that, you have to take into consideration any time 
I modify my integer, the one inside. In, in, in our case, there is no method that modify the, the integer, but it could be. You could have a sorry, you could have a a, a type that has uh, that has uh, some state, and you modify the state because of different operations, right? So any time you modify that state, at least the state that is related to the invariant, we want a justification that you are keeping the invariant uh, uphold, upheld. Sorry. The reason we want that is because the invariants in RAS, at least the ones we use in the kernel and many times we use them, they are related. We use the invariants later to justify the safety, to, to use them as justification for the safety uh, uh, commands that we have. So this is a technique, basically, or a tool, a key tool to, to do that. And that's why we also require the justification for invariants. And we write this. You see the difference here? So in the kernel, we will write invariant, which is a comment, in this line of code, which is the one actually creating the, the instance of the error code. And we say, the check above, this is referring to the if, to the branch, ensure that type invariant holds. So if you have, imagine that you have many methods, not just one, you have many methods, and some of them change the state of error code. Basically, we write the justification why we are not breaking the invariant. Because if you have a method, and then suddenly in one method, for example, you allow, imagine that you allow, you have a method in this error code that basically, if you call it, increments the error code, and you don't check anything, you just increment it. Then a user outside of your, of the kernel create, a driver, for example, a driver could come, get an error code, and then keep calling increase, uh, uh, sorry, increment, 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 until it goes outside of the, of the interval. And then it goes outside of the interval, and then the invariant is not held anymore. And then the, 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 the places in the kernel, like print error, that are using that invariant to, to justify something, then it's, uh, they, 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 that doesn't work anymore, because that is not true anymore, that returning the copy with two code is always valid. Okay, so that's why we write the invariant as well. Uh, I mean the comments, not the not the section. So you see here there is a parallel between like the, with safety. We saw safety sections and safety comments. Safety sections for callers, preconditions, etc. Safety comments for um, the implementation to to justify an unsafe block, an unsafe block to give the proof. The invariance is similar. We have invariance section which is written on the types. Uh, and give you what is the invariant, explain what is the invariant that that type uh, keeps. Uh, and then you have the invariant comment or comments that basically uh, uh, describe uh, why this is true. It's similar to the safety one. Basically, it's a justification. You have to justify why you are keeping the invariant. Okay. Uh, well, let me go quickly. This is an example from the kernel. Uh, in the kernel, we have a C string, okay? And you see here, I modify the slightly, this one, I remove a couple of things after that, it doesn't matter, and quite a big part of code because uh, otherwise it doesn't fit. But basically, you see, again, the pattern here. There is a C string, and the C string says, in invariance, it says, the string is always null terminated and contains no other null bytes in the, in the, within the string, okay? So basically, you, you are guaranteed by this type that all your memory, the vector, uh, the array, if you will, uh, the, the memory region is a string, uh, like a normal C string, and there is no zeros in the middle, and there is one in the end. Okay. And the method, one of the constructors here called try from format, it doesn't matter the, the arguments or anything. The thing is, it returns uh, either the, the C string itself, if everything w went well, or it returns an error. Okay. We have this error type in the kernel, etc., etc., it doesn't matter. And in the end, when we actually created the instance, we say invariant because it's a modification, a mutation. Basically, the construction of the instance, you could think about as a mutation of the state. So we have to justify that the buff, the buffer we are writing there, the variable that we are putting as, uh, as the field, actually uh, has the variant uh, that we need. Okay. So in the code that I didn't put there in the dots, we are writing the null terminator. We are checking there is no other zeros, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Then, and this is um, this is uh, perhaps too too deep to go now, but uh, sometimes uh, uh, basically what we saw in the print error case in the print error case we saw that somebody uses error code 
to get uh, to constrain some parameter. Uh, and then normally you write something based on the, on the post conditions of a method of the type. Or sometimes you may say something about the type invariance, but to justify some safety comment. But here, when you are inside your own type, when you're implementing a method of the type, like error code or C-string, in many cases, you want to use also within your type, so in the method, you want to use the fact that you are holding that invariant to justify something. So for example, here, we are implementing something called the ref, which basically the reference is the, 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 uh, the C-string. Uh, this is a trait, et cetera, et cetera. I will not go into that. But basically, this is, you could think of being inside the type, OK? And we are using type invariant itself to, 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 to guarantee that when we call this other uh, func method or function constructor from, from this um, uh, from, from CS terror, it has some preconditions and we have to guarantee the, those preconditions, et cetera, et cetera. OK? So we are using type invariant directly. We are not even using a post condition of another method of, of uh, CS3. I know, sorry that we don't have too much time to, to go into this, but I, I hope uh, it's uh, a bit clear that type invariants are, are very important uh, to statically create safe APIs. Okay. I have something on examples, I, very, very quickly, because I don't have time. Consider that the structures, this is copied from the kernel. Um, we have a data structure. This, uh, this uh, data structure has some uh, invariants, uh, as we saw. Uh, it's used for other things, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But here we want to see the examples. In Rust, in I mean Rust for Linux in particular, we have example sections. It's a very common section to have in Rust projects, which basically you write after maybe after the invariant it depends uh, the convention in change. But basically after that you write examples. Okay, I mean in the just right after the invariant you would write examples, and examples would look like this. And actually these examples. As you see, I could explain, we don't have much time, but I could explain how, basically, how, what is the pound symbol here, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't really matter. The thing is, you should write examples that show how to use the, the data structure. And actually, and the main sorry, point of this is that these examples are actually code that we compile and even we run. OK, so, so we basically, this is not right now done in the, in the, in the brands that we have uh, public. But uh, I am working on, a, on, on, on the way to basically take these comments and put them as a k-unit test, OK, automatically. But right now, we compile them already, and we run them, but in the host only. So we can only do uh, some tests we cannot do, but uh, other tests we can. For example, this data structure, we could test if it doesn't use, uh, if it didn't use, in this case, it does. But if it didn't use, if it was an abstract uh, data structure that it was not baked, backed, sorry, backed from uh, by the uh, red black tree in the, in the kernel, we could test it as well. So because we run them in the host. But the point is, in the future, at some point, we will have these tests running in the kernel as well, uh, even if they are look like documentation. Okay. So they compile and they run. And they are very useful that they are compiled because we actually, by compiling this, when you write your documentation, first of all, you write the documentation because you have to write it because the rule in the kernel is that you have to provide documentation. And if you don't put examples, normally, we would say, okay, you should perhaps have examples, etc. So imagine that you're writing and you write examples. You write an example. It has to be valid code and it has to compile. And in the future, it will have to actually run the kernel. And this is good because first you do it at the same time you are thinking about your API, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. It forces you also to think about the API, etc. But also the fact that this compiler run it means that the documentation stays is easier to keep, let's say, or there's a higher chance of uh, keeping the documentation in sync because first is Closer to your code, to the to the code that you have, this is right. And you see, it's, it's right above the, the definition of the type. But not only that, it's also the fact that it compiles. It, it allows you to imagine that you change the API of the of the type. You change a method, then all your documentation will not compile anymore. So you have to actually update that. So it's very useful that this compile and 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 uh, and, uh, and, uh, and run. OK, also, uh, we can write assertions, of course, there are several kinds of assertions. The idea is that we take these assertions and we, the, the macro, we, we call the, the, the raw, basically, k unit uh, uh, way to uh, write expectations and, and have them this uh, nicely mapped, et cetera, et cetera. We don't get into that. Uh, normally, it would be, it's nice to write the, the examples with some pros, 
it's some comments. Basically, you write something, you ex give that example, you write something else, you write a second example, you write something else, etc., etc. And, and the more examples you give on how to use the, the, your module or your uh, type, etc., the, the better. Uh, this is basically um, telling you again uh, what I just said. Uh, also, it's useful to show common pitfalls, so not just the right use, but also it's useful to tell to show examples of something that doesn't work. Uh, either you can also you can even uh, check that it doesn't panic, etc., etc. There are several uh, ways to, to do things, but uh, basically, this, the idea is that it's, it's good to have that. Uh, um, uh, sorry, uh, to, 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 to show how it can fail or the common uh, failures that you have seen or, or mistakes that people may have done. Uh, here is how it looks. Uh, I wanted to point out the safety section, the example section. Is look how it looks rendered. The things are highlighted nicely. Uh, there are there's a feature called intra doc links. It automatically links without you having to put a URL or a path uh, functions and etc cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's very very uh, easy to use and everything is linked together. So it's like not like a cross reference or a saker, but it's uh, um, it's like also in, in the Sphinx uh, when you write a, a something you, it links to the to the theme, but everything is in the, what I want to point out is that everything's in the, in the same uh, place. Um, there is a Rust uh, source code view. This is a bit different than what we have in the kernel for, for the documentation at least, not others, but other cross references, references, sorry. But the source here is the source of your documentation, which also contains a type. So this means it's not like sometimes when you go to the, in the Sphinx in the kernel, you click on view source, then it shows the RST file and it doesn't show the actual uh, code. You have to go there to the include file or the implementation to see that. Uh, there is client side search as well. This is how it looks in the in the in the uh, in the kernel or our own documentation. Uh, this is the one that we saw here. Uh, this is the same that we saw before. We saw it here. And then other notes, I will go very, very quickly. Uh, when you write a module, we follow a template that we will be updating because we want to have a way to cross uh, reference the C code and the Rust code, etc. Uh, so that we don't have to write the full URLs, etc. Uh, there are other sections that we may add or we may start using. Uh, also, I encourage uh, people writing this uh, or kernel code to document any typing extensively. Uh, especially if it is a, a modular type, it's very useful to have like a, an overview of the of how it works. Uh, and I will show you here a couple of screenshots of um, of the uh, of, of the back from the standard library. You see here it's showing a, an example that works, an example that doesn't work or panics. Let's say it even has documentation that looks uh, very nice in the page, etc. So it's like uh, you can put drawings and you can put uh, all kinds of things. So basically, as you see, it is different than the kernel. We would put most of this, we would put in the documentation form. So if you write these things here, then it would go alongside the code. And of course, sometimes it's too much to put there, maybe. But other times, uh, it's, it's very nice to have it in, the, in there. Uh, we also follow other coding guidelines. Uh, and yeah, uh, please take a look perhaps at the slides so we can go through in session if there is something about this but uh, yeah uh, i put some uh, useful references for you uh you may look in the, from the slides and i had uh, three slides on tests i will uh yeah basically skip we have three kinds of tests uh, in rust you can take a close uh, look in the documentation but as i said uh, like with the documentation tests we want to run as k unit probably uh, tests we want to also run the unit tests, which can test uh, private code uh, in Rust, and also perhaps integration tests, which uh, basically could be very similar to the KUNIT ones. Uh, unit tests, uh, the one that can test private uh, functions look like this. Uh, we have this, this from the kernel. Uh, we have one to test the CS turf that you, see, that you saw before. Uh, we are running these tests right now and comp compiling, them, compiling them and running them in, the, in, the, in our CI. Uh, we would like to have eventually to have uh, basically the CIs of the, of the uh, we are talking with the CIs of, of, of the kernel to, to run our things or to build tests and list our things. And we would like that they also uh, compile the tests, et cetera, et cetera, and run them if possible. So we are working on that as well. And conclusions, uh, uh, I will put the slide here. There are two slides only. And uh, what I want to tell you is basically all that we are doing in Rust, 
Uh, yes, Rust requires unsafe blocks around operations that may have UV, uh, provides a way to mark functions that uh, trigger UV. We have some rules on top of that, some conventions on top of that, like writing the comments, uh, the safety comments, invariant comments, safety um, sections, etc. Uh, we use a dialect that we hope it becomes the, the official uh, Rust uh, way of writing the unsafe block, etc. Uh, but we are doing all this uh, so that drivers, and this is the important thing, we are all doing all this so that drivers can use only safe code. And in order to be able to write drivers with only safe code, we need APIs that are safe. And in order to do that, normally we have to write types with invariants and uh, Etc. that, that, that uh, allow us to, to review the preconditions and to, to statically ensure something, okay, as we saw through the talk. Um, the code documentation, of course, does not change the behavior of the code, but uh, it's important as we explain to review the, the soundness of a module uh, to make changes easier. Uh, the safety sections are critical, even if you think the comments could be all removed. Safety sections in particular are super important and critical because if you don't have safety sections, then if you have an unsafe function, then you don't know what are actually the preconditions. You, you know it's unsafe, but you don't know why. You would need to review all the code to know. Um, uh, write an example is useful. And we are working uh, again on testing to, to integrate them with, uh, with uh, the other testing support in the cat. And that's it. Thank you. Sorry for the rush in the end. Uh, and that was it. If there is any last minute uh, question, uh, we can take it. There is one minute or not. I don't know. No question. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Thank Miguel. You. Thank you a lot. Bye. Thank you Bye. for the questions and, uh, and uh, being here. And thanks for uh, following the session. And thank you to uh, the Dream Foundation for hosting and, and inviting me. Well, great. Thank you so much to Miguel and Shua for your time today, and thank you to everyone who joined us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux you. Foundation YouTube page later today, and a copy of the presentation slides will be added to the Linux Foundation website. We hope you're able to join us for future mentorship sessions. Have a wonderful day.